Welcome to LG Ministry. I'm grateful that you have joined me today to hear another lesson from God's Word. I always strive to present the truth, and I hope the lessons I preach will challenge you to grow as a Christian and will cause you to be uplifted so that you might grow closer to God. So let's dive in and discover the treasures of His teaching together. In this lesson, we continue our theme of the strange and the spooky. Toward the end of our lesson, we will look at Saul and his encounter with the medium. I'm saving that for the end because many view this as one of the most difficult stories in the Old Testament. However, I think it will be easier for us to understand that story once we look at what the rest of the Bible says about magicians and mediums. It seems that the mediums, sorcerers, magicians, and the like began in the Egyptian culture. The first time we see them mentioned in the Bible was when Joseph was in prison and the Pharaoh was having a dream that he wanted to know what it meant. Genesis 41, verse number 8. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. As we look at these passages, I want you to notice the pattern. First, you'll see people who were practicing these divination arts. Second, I want you to observe how these people were always limited in what they could do. And third, I want you to notice that when God was involved with one of His people, they could do what self-proclaimed magicians and mediums could not. In our verse, we see that none of these magicians or wise men could interpret the Pharaoh's dream, which made the Pharaoh very angry. However, he finds out about this man named Joseph who can tell him about what his dreams mean. In Genesis 41, verse number 15, it says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give the Pharaoh an answer of peace. Notice, Joseph didn't say that he had the ability by himself to interpret the king's dream, but that it was only through God that he could do such a thing. Again, we see a stark contrast between Joseph and the magicians because Joseph gives credit to God for his ability, while the others usually give themselves credit for their own supposed ability. Of course, Joseph could interpret the dream when these others could not. Our next example comes from the book of Exodus when Moses started performing miracles in the form of plagues so that the Pharaoh would let the children of Israel go. Let's look at the first encounter, Exodus 7, verse number 10. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. In this example, the magicians could also throw their rods down and make them turn into snakes. Again, this is a trick that magicians can pull off today by using trickery. But the rod that Aaron threw down wasn't done by mere trickery. It actually happened. And to show that it wasn't just a trick, God's serpent ate the other serpents, showing that God's power was real and greater than any of the tricks these magicians could create. Now, many of the plagues that Moses brought forth by the power of God were explained away by the magicians, and they would show how a person could do it. However, I believe that when they were doing their rendition of what Moses did, they did it on a small scale, simply using sleight of hand or other man-made techniques. We also learned that these magicians could not re reproduce all of the things that God was doing through these plagues. And they admitted that they could not. It even said that God was making these things happen. Exodus 8 verse 18. 
Now the magicians so worked their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there was lice on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. These magicians were limited in what they could do, and they could not even begin to touch the power of God. Now, let's look at a couple of New Testament examples. In Acts 8 and verse number 9, we read this, But there was a certain man named Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Here we learn how Philip was going to Samaria to teach the people about Christ. Now Philip wasn't going around trying to make a name for himself by using miracles. No, he was using the miracles and signs to prove his words about Jesus that they were coming from God. And this is exactly what the Bible teaches us that the purpose of the miracles were for. Mark 16 verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. A man named Simon had astonished these people for a long time with his bag of tricks, and they thought he was someone great until they saw what real miracles were all about through the hands of Philip. Even Simon himself, knowing that his tricks were fake, was truly amazed at the miracles and signs that Philip had done. And so Simon gives up his bag of tricks and he becomes a Christian. Our next example comes from one of Paul's adventures as recorded in Acts chapter 19, starting at verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left and the evil spirits went out from them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The credit is given to God for working unusual miracles through Paul. It was already amazing enough with regular miracles and regular signs being done, but to see unusual miracles happening must have been something else. In contrast, these seven sons of Siva thought that they could chant or invoke the name of Jesus and would be able to work a sign such as casting a demon out. But they find out quickly that it takes more than just evoking the name of Jesus as they are beaten up, stripped of their clothes, and have to run away from the house naked for all to see. Now we must remember that Ephesus was full of people who believed in other gods and, and the art of magic. So when the people heard this story, it caused many of the city to turn away from the so-called magic. And they had a great book burning that day. And the value of what they destroyed would have been worth around forty dollars to $50,000 today. Now we have looked at two examples from the Old Testament and two examples from the New Testament. More examples could be given, but you can see from these examples that these magicians were fakes and they were very limited in what they could do. Now I want you to write down these next verses because they teach us that magicians and the like are indeed just fake. Zechariah 10 verse number 2, For the idols speak delusion, the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams, they comfort in vain. Jeremiah 14, verse 14, And the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. 
that they prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Ezekiel 13, verse 6, They have envisioned futility and false divination, saying, Thus says the Lord, but the Lord has not sent them, yet they hope that the word may be confirmed. Have you not seen a futile vision, and have you not spoken false divination? You say, The Lord says, but I have not spoken. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken nonsense and envisioned lies, therefore I am indeed against you, says the Lord God. I believe these verses show that those who are magicians and, and the like, that they're nothing more than tricksters, people who tell lies about what they see, and they do their best to deceive those around them. If any of these people performed any real magic, I would have to say that their power could have come maybe from the devil himself. But even his power was limited based on what God allowed him to do, such as in the story of Job. For example, he could only send fire down on his animals and make a strong wind blow that blew the house down that killed his children. And again, this was something that he was allowed to do by God. Also in the New Testament, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 9, the coming of the lawless one and according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish. We also learn that during the New Testament time, when demon possession was allowed to happen, one lady is said to have had the ability to foretell the future, as found in Acts 16, verse number 16. However, even if and when someone did signs by the power of the devil, it was still a limited power that could not come close to the power of God. Of course, I believe anything supernatural would not have gone beyond the first century anyway. Again, we can see that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and, and also in Ephesians chapter 4. Another thing we need to do is to compare how God's people used objects to get an answer from God and how the magicians and others used objects to practice their sorcery. First, let's look at a few examples of what God's people used. Our first example comes from Judges chapter 6 where Gideon used a fleece to get an answer from God. Judge 6, verse number 36. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early that next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. Not only was this done once, it was done twice, and we see a clear answer given by God controlling the dew. Another example was the use of casting lots. Proverbs 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The casting of lots was sometimes used to decide whether someone was guilty or innocent. This was not some random chance like throwing some dice because God was in control of the outcome. The same method was used to determine who the next apostle would be, Acts 1, verse 24. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So again, they're casting lots, but you notice they asked God to let them know. And so it was through these casting of lots that God would make it land on whatever it needed to land to show the will of God. Now magicians and others also used a variety of things to pull off their tricks. Hosea 4 verse 12, My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. Ezekiel 21 verse 21, for the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the road, at the fork of the two roads, to use divination. He shakes the arrows, he consults the images, he looks at the liver. Now sometimes they would use a stick or a staff and, and they'd drop it. 
And whichever side it ended up on, that would give the person the answer of yes or no. Of course, we know that that was truly a random type of answer. Now, sometimes they would shake an arrow to find the answers or cut open an animal and look at its liver for a sign. Of course, we know that this was people, whenever they're looking at livers, they're having to make up things. Oh, it looks like it's going to be this way or that way. It was all things that they were making up in their head. Of course, another thing that they supposedly did was to talk to the dead. Again, there are more examples I could give, but this is good enough to show you that there were some similarities between these two. But the big difference is, is that God was in control of those instances that his people would use objects to get answers. But magicians and others, they got their answers again by random chance or by making up things that they supposedly saw in livers and things like that. God makes it clear that magicians, mediums, and the like were to be avoided or killed in the Old Testament time. Deuteronomy 18 verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. Leviticus 20 verse 27, A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Now let's consider what the Bible has to say about speaking to the dead to see if it's possible. The first thing we learn is that only God has the power over the soul. Matthew 10 verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Every instance you read of in the Bible where someone has died and then they came back to life, it was because his soul re-entered his body by the power of God. No human has the power to do this on his own. As Ecclesiastes 8 verse 8 says, No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. The Bible never mentions the devil having this power either. Once we die, our souls go to a place called Hades. According to the story that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, it is not possible for the rich man or Lazarus to cross that impassable gulf that's between them. And we also learn that no one was going to be sent back from the dead. Now think about this. If they couldn't leave that place, what makes us think that someone on this earth could have the ability to summon them up from this place or to speak to them? Based on what the Bible teaches and the examples of the rich man and Lazarus, I do not believe that mediums can speak to the dead or bring them forth. I don't believe the devil has this power to do this either. Notice what Revelation 1.18 says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. Not only uh, did Jesus have the keys to Hades and death at this time, I believe, of course, God has always had the keys to Hades and death which means that God is the one that's in control and not even the devil would have the power to take a soul from this area. I have a few more passages that show that once a person dies, they they don't know what's happening on the earth. So when people say that, oh, I hope grandma or grandpa is looking down on me, I don't believe this is true. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse number 5 says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Now this passage is not teaching that we will know nothing in the sense that we are in an unaware state or maybe we're just conked out, we don't know anything. Because our story of the rich man and Lazarus makes it clear that we are fully conscious after we die. Instead, it says that when we die, we will no longer have anything to do with what's currently happening on the earth. That is why the last part of verse 6 says that we will never have a share in anything done under the sun. Once we die, we cannot receive any more rewards for what we do on the earth because we're dead. So I believe this passage, coupled with the story of rich men and Lazarus, shows that no man or devil 
could speak with or conjure up those who have passed away. Okay, now that we have a good foundation based upon what the Bible teaches as a whole regarding magicians, mediums, and the like, we can now take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, which tells us of Saul and his encounter with the medium. 1 Samuel 28 verse 3, Now Samuel had died, and all of Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah in his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped at Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped at Geboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dream or by Urim or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come up on you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me any more, neither by prophet nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? And the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Then immediately Saul fell full length on the ground and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no food all day or all night. And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and have put my life in my hands, and I have put my life in my hands, and heeded the words which you spoke to me. Now therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant, and let me set a piece of bread before you, and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused, and said, I will not eat. So his servants together with the woman urged him, and he heeded their voice. Then he arose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatty calf in the house, and she hastened to kill it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread from it. So she brought it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. Now this text is deemed difficult because there are some details that are missing, which makes it kind of vague. But based upon the background study we just did about magicians and mediums, I don't believe this lady had the power to talk to the dead and that she is just a big old fake. I think one of our first pieces of evidence comes from verse 12 when it said, The woman saw Samuel. She cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. This medium did indeed see Samuel. And our text implies that he told her that the king Saul was with her because she suddenly knows the identity of Saul. 
We also see that she cried out, showing me that she was surprised about what was happening. At first, only the medium seems to be able to see Samuel, but starting in verse 15, it appears that Samuel begins talking directly to Saul and tells him that he is going to die along with his sons tomorrow. The question is, by what power is Samuel speaking to Saul at this time? I believe we have already ruled out the medium. She didn't have this type of power. So I want to offer three possibilities that I found, and then I'll let you know which one I think fits the text best. The first one I found is this. Some seem to think that this whole encounter is a lie from the medium. In other words, she is just putting on a good show, and you know she knew all along that Saul was with her. Now, I don't like this particular explanation because there's just too many things going on in the text and too much information that the medium would have to know in order to pull this trick off. Not to mention the fact that what Samuel said came to pass about the death of Saul and his sons. So I would rule that one out completely. Number two, some have suggested that the devil transformed himself into looking like and sounding like Samuel to mess with Saul even more. While it might, and I do stress, might be possible for the devil to transform himself in such a way. It is highly unlikely that he would do this. And what, would, what purpose would it serve? I mean, why would he do this? I mean, just basically given the message of what's going to happen to Saul, that he and his sons are going to die the next day. So again, I reject this particular idea as well. Now, this third explanation is the one that I like the best, and it makes the most sense to me. I believe that God allowed Samuel to speak to Saul one last time to show Saul that even if he tries to get an answer from the dead, it is not going to change the fact that God's spirit has left him and that his kingdom is going to be taken away from him and it's his sons and himself are going to be killed the next day. This explanation makes the most sense to me because I know that God has the power to do this because he allowed Moses and Elijah to appear with Jesus in front of Peter, James, and John. And we have seen God get his point across to people in many strange and spooky ways. So I believe that this is the best explanation of what is what happening in our text. So in conclusion, you may hear strange stories or see strange things happening around you, but they usually have a logical answer to why they're happening. Also, we must never underestimate the ability of our brains to deceive us, especially if we want something to be true or we're in a highly emotional state. Though we have many shows on TV that have made sup the supernatural popular, they are just shows. Based on my study of God's Word, no supernatural activities are happening in our time. No humans can do real magic or summon up the dead to speak to them. There are no ghosts or demons that are plaguing mankind today. So let us not be tricked by the fakers or by allowing our imaginations to go wild and think that we see these things or experience these things. Instead, let's put our faith and trust in God and realize that He is in control. I appreciate you listening to my lesson and I hope you found it to be biblical and I hope it challenged you in some way. I would even be happy if it just made you think about your life or about God. I think it's important that we listen to and study God's Word as often as we can. Now one thing I want to make clear is that I don't want you to treat my Word as if it's the Word of God. I say this because I'm just a man. However, I will always do my best to study God's Word and to teach the truth. But I can make mistakes just like anyone else can. So always go to God's Word to confirm what I'm teaching. We all need to be good Bereans. If you find that I'm preaching something wrong, please let me know and be ready to show me from Scripture where I got it wrong. Because as a teacher of God, I know that I'll be judged with a harsher judgment by God. James 3, verse number 1. I would also greatly appreciate it if you would tell people about LG Ministry. You can find all my videos on YouTube. Just search by my name or search by LG Ministry and you should easily find the channel or you can go to lgministry.org. Our lessons are seen by people all over the world. So I hope you will continue to watch our program and pray that we'll be able to plant God's Word for many years to come.